Aid to the Church in Need and its donors have been there to help since 1947, never abandoning the church or her most vulnerable children. Will you stand up for your faith and accompany our brothers and sisters on their spiritual journey? Visit churchinneed.org. churchinneed.org. After kicking out 12 pro-life students and chaperones, the Smithsonian Institute in D.C. is being sued. For safety, all the students wore the same blue hats that happened to read, Rosary Pro-Life. Attorney Jordan Sekulo with the ACLJ says the blatant discrimination clearly violates First Amendment constitutional protections. Abortion advocates call chemical abortion safer than Tylenol. Tylenol should sue. Reports are being released of a 19-year-old Canadian woman who died from septic shock, a known risk of mifepristone. While this woman is the first to die since introduction in Canada five years ago, another death shut down drug trials in 2001. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. This is Franciscan Media's Saint of the Day for February 7th. Today we celebrate St. Colette. A quiet life of prayer and devotion was Colette's path to sanctity. Born in France in 1381, Colette lived the life of a hermit following her father's death. She followed the third rule of St. Francis and became a so-called anchoress, a woman walled into a room whose only opening was a window into a church. She developed a reputation for holiness and many people went to her for spiritual direction. After four years, Colette left her tiny cell and, with the encouragement of the Pope, joined the Poor Clares. Serving as Abbess General, she began the work of restoring the primitive rule of St. Clair in the 17 monasteries she established. Though she met with some initial opposition, the reform movement took root in France and spread elsewhere as well. She and her sisters became known for their poverty and fasting. Colette began her reform during the time of the Great Western Schism, where three men claimed to be Pope, and Western Christianity was deeply divided. Her efforts were aimed at reminding not just the poor Clares, but also the entire church, of the need to follow Christ more closely. She died in 1447. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. Coming up on A Catholic Take, Editor-in-Chief at Crisis Magazine, Eric Sammons is our guest. He's looking at the incredible, shrinking Catholic Church. 50 years of downward trend. How do we reverse all of it and grow again? Plus, Robert Spencer's going to be on from Jihad Watch. Elon Omar lost her seat. There are Islamic attacks in Spain and elsewhere. The latest stories with Robert Spencer all on A Catholic Take, 7 a.m. Eastern. Do you love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. This is Joe McLean, and you're listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of the truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. that you meet. There is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take with Joe McLean, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. And it's going to be a great program today. Here's a question. Is the Catholic Church dying? 
Are we seeing the incredible shrinking Catholic Church? We're going to have that conversation with editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Eric Sammons is going to be our guest. He's coming up at 30 past the hour. Of course, the answer is no, she's not dying, but she is shrinking, and the numbers don't look good. So we're going to talk all about that with Eric Sammons later in the hour. Robert Spencer from Jihad Watch is going to be on. We're going to catch up on the Rep. Elon Omar story from last week being booted off the Intelligence Committee. That was kind of a big deal. What's the story there? Robert Spencer weighs in on that at 15 past the hour. Do join us if you can. Lots of stories in the news today, of course. We're going to be catching you up on that. We have a great Saint of the Day, Gospel Day. Plus, if you can join us, we always do uh, like an after show thing. It happens. It's a half hour after we say goodbye on the radio. You can find us linked up on YouTube, on Rumble, on Facebook. Go to the stationofthecross.com. Look for the show, A Catholic Take. You can find some links there. Or just search for Joe McLean on YouTube. That's another way to do it. But let's pray. Let's begin. We have so much to discuss. Please do share us with a friend. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your saint of the day. Saint Theodore Strelitus was born in the late 3rd century. He was a Roman general and a convert to Christianity during a time of persecution. He was exposed as a Christian and a military tribunal decided that he was a good soldier and, uh, you know, he just made a mistake. So they asked him to reconsider his, his actions, his choices, but they set him free. He promptly burned down a pagan temple. This is my kind of guy. I like this dude. He was arrested again and he was ordered to apostatize, but then he was tortured because he said, of course not. Why would anybody apostatize? That's ridiculous. So they tortured him and they ripped off his flesh and he responded by reciting the Psalms. And of course he was martyred. Now there's another saint with a very similar name, Saint Theodore Tyro. It is almost certainly the same person as uh, Saint Theodore Strelatus, but uh, the Tyro story describes the soldier as a recruit and not a general in the feast days on the 9th of November. The region is slightly different, but the story is almost uh, certainly the same. Saint Theodore Strelatus died in 319 in Thrace. Saint Theodore Strelatus, pray for us. And now your headline news. LifeSite News reports breaking Ontario police arrest Josh Alexander, who protested the boys' and girls' bathrooms for, for attending class. And now, our, we brought this story to you just yesterday, as a fact, but uh, Alexander protested his Catholic school in St. Joseph's last year in Ontario, allowing gender-confused males to use girls' bathrooms, and was then suspended this is at a Catholic school. Keep that in mind. His tweet today included a photo of him in front of his school and being taken into custody by members of the Ontario Provincial Police. Where's the bishop and all that? I'm just curious. Just wondering. Hmm. Hey, Ground News reports earthquake death toll in Turkey and Syria surpasses 5,000. Turkish Vice President Fuat Okte said Tuesday that the death toll from the earthquakes centered in southeastern Turkey rose to 3419, bringing the total, including those killed in Syria, Syria to more than 5,000. Let's keep them in our prayers today. Fox News reports 11 Oregon counties voted to secede from the state and join Idaho over high taxes and crime. Over the last two years, the Greater Idaho Movement has worked to gather constituent sentiment around the proposal. Business owners surround, uh, sounded off on Oregon's tax policy, detailing the burden taken on by corporate activity tax. However, if Idaho and Oregon were to somehow negotiate a border adjustment deal, the U.S. Congress would have to sign off on it, in addition to both Oregon and Idaho legislatures. Uh, what do you bet? You want to put some odds down? What do you think this is going to get passed? I'm just curious. The Post Millennial reports the Chinese spy balloon that we covered yesterday with Matt Dooley. Well, guess what? Apparently, he was carrying explosives in order to self-detonate. Following the shooting down of a Chinese spy balloon over the weekend, Pentagon officials have revealed that the balloon potentially was carrying explosives to destroy itself. According to the Daily Mail, 
Air Force General Glenn Van Herc, commander of U.S. Northern Command, revealed in a Monday call with reporters that the balloon, in addition to potentially carrying the explosives, was some 200 feet tall, weighed thousands of pounds, and its payload was the size of a jetliner. Wow, and those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. When the Pharisees, with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean hands, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that they have traditionally observed, the purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes questioned him, Why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the human precepts. You disregard God's commandment, but cling to human tradition. He went on to say, How well you have set aside the commandment of God in order to uphold your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever curses father or mother shall die. Yet you say, if someone says to father or mother, Any support you have had from me is korban meaning dedicated to God, you allow him to do nothing more for his father or mother. You nullify the word of God in favor of your tradition that you have handed on. And you do many such things. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Notice here, this is like the verse that gets quoted quite often against Catholics by non-Catholics. You know, see, the Bible says... You know, you uh, you hold up these traditions of men and you nullify God's word. But notice nowhere in the passage, nowhere in the passage does it actually say that Jesus condemns all traditions. Nowhere does it say he condemns all traditions. In fact, Jesus kept many, many traditions perfectly, I would say. Where where does it say the tradition of providing wine at a wedding, you know, for instance, is a good good example. The fact that he went to every single synagogue, he went to the synagogue every single Saturday. He made every major feast in Jerusalem. He kept all of the traditions associated with those uh, throughout his life and his public ministry. So there are many traditions that he kept and also helped to pass on. So at no time does he condemn all traditions, just those that that go against the will of God. Haydock's commentary says, it is groundless to pretend from this text that the precepts and traditions of the church are not binding and obligatory. For Christ himself has commanded all to hear his church and obey their lawful pastors. These indeed may be called the precepts of men, but they are precepts of men invested with power and authority from God and of whom Christ himself said, he that heareth you heareth me and he that despiseth you despiseth me. The Ignatius Catholic Commentary points a lot out today. It says, The tradition of the elders, religious customs manufactured by the Pharisees and added to the Mosaic Law, sometimes called the Oral Law, this body of rituals was was designed to supplement God's written law and intensifies its requirement of ritual purity. These traditions were passed on orally until recorded in the Jewish Mishnah about the year A.D. 200. Here, the controversy is sparked by the unwashed hands of the disciples. The Pharisees charged them, not with poor hygiene, but with religious laxity. Jesus responds with a vigorous attack on these Pharisaic customs because they distract practitioners from the more important principles of the Mosaic Law. That is, the they emphasize the dangers of ritual impurity to the neglect of moral defilement defined by the commandments. In the end, these traditions prompted by the elders are examples of merely human traditions that the Pharisees have wrongly elevated to an equal level with the revealed law of God. Now, that's very interesting. So what exactly is this Corban thing in this verse? Well, if you were were a young man, let's say, and your parents were getting up there in age, and you're like, you know, I really don't want to, I really, you know, don't want to have to support them. So the Pharisees would pressure them. 
these young men, and they would get them to put their property into the temple as korban. As de they dedicate, I dedicated my land to God, Father. I'm so sorry. I'd help you out, Mom and Dad. I really, really would. I, phew, you, my heart is for you, and you know that. But I've given everything I've got. I've dedicated it all to God. So it belongs to the temple. Nothing I can do. Sorry. Huh. Good luck. God bless. Have a great life. Hope that all works out for you. You see, that would be a contradiction to the commandment to honor one's father and mother. To somehow put it under the temple tax. These Pharisees took great pleasure in uh, having access to such great property, such great wealth. You know, making sure that they got that tithe. When uh, moms and dads that were elder needed support from their children because that's the design of God. So those are the kinds of examples where traditions of men can supplant God's word and God's will. And we should never do those. But yet St. Paul says to hold fast to the traditions handed on either by word of mouth or by letter. So not all traditions have been condemned. Amen. Praise be to God. Robert Spencer is coming up right after the break. We're going to be talking about Elon Omar, jihadwatch.org. It's up next. Don't go anywhere. Please join Father Mark Noonan in praying the Litany of Humility. O oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world others may increase and I may decrease, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Coming up at 35 past the hour, 30 past the hour, Eric Sammons is going to be our guest, editor-in-chief at Crisis Magazine. He put on a podcast recently, The Incredible Shrinking Catholic Church, and uh, it's a topic I've talked a lot about in my years on radio. In 50 years, 60 years, we've seen nothing but decline. And, uh, you know, if you were the CEO of this organization, you probably lose your job by now because these aren't good numbers. So what does this mean? Is the church dying? What can we do about it? Is it possible to reverse these, this? Eric Sammons weighs in on all of those questions coming up at 30 past the hour. So do join us if you can. But joining us right now is Robert Spencer from jihadwatch.org. Good morning to you, Robert Spencer. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Praise be to God. I'm alive. That counts. How are you? Thank God. Very good. Thank God. Excellent. <laughs> Praise be to God. I'm glad to have you back on our show. Thanks for, for doing it. Thanks for coming on today. Let's talk about Elon Omar. That was a big deal last week uh, that she got removed from the House Intelligence Committee. Give us the backstory. Well, you know, this is something that is likely to have been the result of the little revolt that we saw over who was going to be Speaker of the House after the Republicans regained a majority. The uh, holdout wanted Kevin McCarthy, the current Speaker, to show a little more spine 
and to act like a real opposition rather than a controlled opposition. And he had actually said that he would remove Omar from the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee if he was made speaker, but nobody really believed him because he's been so spineless in the past. But there's abundant reason to remove Omar from this committee. She's made, frankly, anti-Semitic statements on numerous occasions. She's even made anti-American statements likening the U.S. military to the Taliban. And so this is not somebody that really has any reason to be on such a committee or even to be in the House of Representatives. And it's good that finally McCarthy had the guts to take a stand. In your article, Elon Omar has finally gotten her comeuppance, uh, which is linked up at jihadwatch.org. I'll put a link to this in our live video feeds, by the way. Um, you, you mentioned how when she was pressing Nancy Pelosi, this was a few years ago, she really, really, really wanted to be on this particular committee. Why would that be? Why would she want to be on this committee? Uh, why would Nancy Pelosi have let her on this committee? I don't think Nancy liked her, did she? No, uh, not at all. There doesn't seem to have been any love lost between the two. But Ilhan Omar's primary purpose of being in the House was to be on something like the Foreign Affairs Committee and to speak out about foreign policy issues, particularly to attack Israel and undermine the alliance between the United States and Israel wherever possible, and to boost frankly, what are foes of the United States at this point, particularly Turkey, where she has met in and had a very friendly conversation with the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who is increasingly uh, open about his authoritarianism, his aggressive designs on the region, and his anti-Americanism. Can you give us a bit of her backstory? Because this is she's an interesting character on many levels, not just on her the fact that she's involved in the uh, the House committee there, but uh, the fact that she's she had some really strange relationships in her past. At one point, being even married to her own brother. What, what is her background? Yeah, she was married to her own brother, but we should understand that that seems to have been a case of immigration fraud rather than of incest. Uh, there doesn't seem to have been any indication that it was a genuine marriage. It was just so that he could get uh, legitimized in terms of his presence in the United States. She posed as, as his wife rather than as his sister. Now, the question, the larger question here is, does somebody who did something like that belong in the House of Representatives, much less on any committee. And right. the problem yeah. here is that she reflects political views that are in the broad mainstream of the Democrat Party at this point. Her, her hatred of the United States, her very far leftism, her aggressively belligerent stance toward Israel and toward, for that matter, the, uh, opposite, the loyal opposition in the United States, these things all coalesce with so much in the Democrat Party. This is one reason why Pelosi had to give way, despite their personal antipathy, and put her on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the first place. So, all right, so she has a long track record, a history of anti-Semitic language that she is apparently not afraid of saying publicly all the time. Um, you know, and very interesting because we live in a time and an age where if I say anything that seems critical of the Jews, then you just get labeled anti-Semitic. But apparently she's gotten away with it for a long time. But she seemed to change her tune recently. Did she see this coming? Did she? She must have felt like the pressure was on and she may get booted. Yes, exactly. She did. And she wanted to emphasize that uh, merely to speak critically of the state of Israel is not anti-Semitism. However, her statements are quite clear, and she went far beyond that in echoing ancient anti-Semitic uh, uh, lines about uh, Jews being uh, buying influence and being powerful and running secretly running everything behind the scenes and all that. And so uh, this is something that goes far beyond just criticism of Israel. So do you do you think that since Ilan Omar has been removed, 
is this going does are we seeing the end of her political career do you think she'll she still has plenty of support back home uh it seems like that part of minnesota is uh, heavy in uh, the migrant community from uh, muslims so maybe she probably could see a, a a continued career here or what is your outlook oh yeah there's no doubt if she wants to stay in the house she can stay in the house for life uh, this is a district where the overwhelming majority of people are Somali immigrants like Ilhan Omar herself. And so they consider a vote for her to be a simple matter of loyalty to one's own people. And I don't mean the American people. And the uh, seat is thus secure unless there's some massive demographic change in that district, which doesn't look likely. It's only likely to become more of a sure thing for her, not less. Uh, but the deeper problem is the question of whether these people in the majority have loyalty to the United States at all, or whether their loyalty is to their home country and to other powers altogether and other entities altogether. And so it's kind of ironic and I guess that's... when she's talking about double loyalty to right. the, between Israel and the United States. Really, the real double loyalty issue is with uh, Muslim migrants and particularly Somalis. And I guess that's why it seems rather strange that Ms. Omar could have made it on the House Intelligence Committee, given some of her background issues with immigration fraud, for instance, as you mentioned earlier, and these questionable loyalties. Should that is that the kind of person that we would want to have access to some of the most highly classified intelligence uh, on the planet? Well, it's just just the opposite of the kind of person in a in a sane world. But we have the Democrat Party, where anti-Americanism has become mainstream. And so Ilhan Omar is some kind of a hero. And actually, that's something I meant to address in, in connection with your uh, last question about is this the end for her? Uh, not only can she get reelected indefinitely, but also her star is only rising. And now she's a martyr wow. as well as being a hero of the left. Uh, we saw that with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's very spirited defense of her and denunciation of McCarthy for removing her from the committee, uh, there's going to be a lot of defiant counter moves now that will only increase her influence. Okay, so also in your article, you, you mentioned Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff, you know, in passing, but both of those characters I would throw into the like of the same bucket. We don't, these are the kind of people we don't really want having access to critical, sensitive, classified intelligence. Uh, because both of these characters seem to be compromised. Right, they are. Uh, Schiff has been caught in numerous lies regarding the Russian collusion hoax and other issues. Swalwell, of course, had the famous affair with the Chinese spy. And so these people should have been repudiated by their own party. But it just shows how far the Democrats have gone down the road of anti-Americanism that they're indignant that these guys were removed from their committees. So what is the backlash pressure? I know that AOC put on a really good show preaching up pretty heavily Pentecostal style on the House floor when Rep. Uh, Omar got uh, taken and removed from the committee. Do you see that backlash growing? Do you think it's just a flash in the pan and we'll just all move on? Or are they just all waiting for, for the next political cycle, election cycle to gain back power? Oh, yes, certainly. That's the thing about the left is they never give up. And that's something that really uh, we should all learn from. They never take a setback as the end or stop or change course or reconsider their ultimate goals. They always just go on and press them in different ways. And so, yes, they're going to be trying to come back with a House majority in 24, which they very may well get. And uh, even if they don't, then they will continue to exalt Omar as being a hero who has been mm -hmm. unjustly maligned for her courageous stands. I want to switch subjects on you real quick because we have a few minutes left with Robert Spencer from jihadwatch.org. I wanted to get your take on, I saw a story yesterday, I reported it. Uh, Iran is issuing thousands of pardons. Uh, are they trying to make up with all the revolutionaries, the taking off the hijabs, the dancing in the streets? I mean, we. it seems like uh, the West is being fed a story, but uh, life doesn't seem any better in Iran anymore. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's really incredible, really, what's going on there. Because, see, the Quran, the holy book of Islam, says, strike terror in the enemies of Allah. Now, that is very important in regard to Iran and the protests, because Iran for years has termed dissidents against the regime enemies of Allah. And thus, they pursued a policy of straight-out terror against these protesters, giving them massive, long sentences in prison or uh, executing them outright. And they were just doing what the Holy Book of Islam says, strike terror in the enemies of Allah. But this time, it didn't work. The enemies of Allah, so-called, kept coming and were not terrorized. And so now they have admitted that it didn't work, and they're trying to hold on to power and keep from being overthrown altogether by relenting. And that's the significance of these pardons. It's really extraordinary what's going on there. They are realizing that the Quranic prescription for how to solve their problem did not work, and they have to take a different tack. But they just gave this couple for dancing 10 years in prison. Yeah, it's sort of a uh, one step forward and two steps back situation. And I don't really, I cannot really explain why they are being draconian in some contexts and then lenient in others. But the fact that there's any lenience at all is an indication that they realize that the protests are a manifestation of something that they cannot break by their ordinary methods, which are the straight out terror. So. Okay, if they're making these slips, I, I'm makes me curious. I wonder if this is, we're seeing the end of this regime here. I'd have to have you back because we're out of time. But Robert Spencer, thanks for your insight. Jihadwatch.org is his website. Check it out. A lot of great information there, wonderful articles. If you're looking for good insight into all these headlines and these stories, jihadwatch.org is the website. Coming up. Right after this break, we have more breaking news and stories with you. Did you see that the demonic presentation at the Grammys? Yeah, neither did I because I don't watch that stuff. But I do have a story for you related to that coming up at the break. And Eric Sammons is on to talk about the decline of the church. Is the Catholic Church dying? What can we do about reversing the negative trends? All of that with Eric Sammons from Crisis Magazine. And a whole lot more A Catholic Take is coming up right next. But do me a favor first. And share us with a friend. I'd be very grateful. Right now, text your buddies. Let, it, let, it, let them know about us. The Catholic Take is coming right back. Are you ready to take on the world of flesh and the devil with just the facts? This is Jesse Romero, host of Jesus 911, heard weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'm joined each day by a variety of co-hosts like Ruben Avam, Paul Clay, Dan Schneider, and my amazing wife, Anita Romero. We tackle Catholic devotions, spiritual warfare, family life, saving America, and everything in between. Join us each weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Jesus 911. God bless you. Keep the faith. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. When determining specific moral truths, most Christian churches say they use the Bible, so it's safe to say that they have agreement on doctor-assisted suicide, abortion, contraception, and embryonic stem cell therapy. Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a challenge for you. Speak with the five closest non-Catholic church pastors near to where you live. Inquire if they only use the Bible to determine their church stances on these issues. Secondly, my findings, there are some similarities on abortion, but varied with two key exemptions. No common stance on embryonic stem cell therapy, contraception was accepted by all, and no across-the-board agreement on doctor-assisted suicide. And thirdly, my comeback. Should these social issues of life really be determined through individual conviction? Well, maybe we should just leave the determinants of salvation up for grabs also. Remember, the ones Jesus called the least of these will always be in grave danger if their existence is left up to individual conviction. Finally, check the very stance of the Catholic Church on these weighty issues. It's impressive. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. 
The Post reports a new study found that most that the most educated are the least likely to want to be vaccinated. According to a new paper by researchers from Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh, the researchers analyzed more than 5 million survey responses by a range of different demographic details and classified these people who would probably or definitely not choose to get vaccinated as vaccine hesitant. It found that people with master's degrees had the least hesitancy and the highest hesitancy was with those that had PhDs. Hmm. Very, very fascinating. Trending Politics reports Speaker McCarthy agrees to release all January 6 video footage as Democrats are trying to pressure him to keep him hidden. Wonder why? Hmm. Wonder what's in there. Anyway, the Blaze reports CBS deletes the We Are Ready to Worship tweet that it had posted ahead of Sam Smith's unholy Grammy performance. Do you watch the Grammys? Did you watch the Grammys? I mean, I hope not because that's insane stuff there and you shouldn't let that into your brain, let alone your house. But anyway, Sam Smith, who identifies as a non-binary, and Kim Petros, who identifies as a transgendered woman, won the Grammy for Best Pop Duo Group Performance for the song Unholy. The two gave a demonic appearing performance at the Grammys that GOP Senator Ted Cruz described as evil. Well, I would too, by the way. However, there was a tweet. This performer sent out a tweet before the Grammy started. And uh, I guess they were rehearsing and uh, he said it's going to be... It's, uh, we are ready to worship is what CBS said. He said it's going to be a special, special event. But CBS replied... We are ready to worship. So they deleted this tweet last night. However, the internet doesn't get deleted because you can always find find whatever they delete on uh, the Wayback Machine. And so I have a copy of the tweet right in front of me. And yes, TBS is all for demonic devil worship. Hopefully you're not giving them any more of your money. And those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Joining us right now by telephone is editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine, Eric Sammons. Good morning to you, Eric. Good morning, Joe. How are you doing? Praise be to God, I am alive and that counts. How are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm doing good. It's a little early, good. but that's okay. <laughs> so, all the coolest people on planet Earth get up early, Eric, and you're among that, them. So congratulations. True. That is true. You definitely want to get up early <laughs> if you want to get at it. <laughs> do you, uh, pop quiz, do you, do you watch the Grammys? Is the Grammys a thing at your house? Oh dear Lord, no! I don't watch. I've never. I, I don't ever watch any of those award shows. I've never been interested in, in them. And of course, in the past, maybe ten, fifteen years, they're just mostly evil. So yeah, definitely yeah, not not of sure. interest in the Salmon's household. But did you watch it as a kid? Like, remember when a kid, like the Oscars, was a thing when we were kids? I do. Back, think, way back in the day, know, 30, 40 years yeah, ago. My parents. My parents were, really, were not really into it very much either. So I do have a few memories, oh, wow. though, of when I was a, like a teenager, maybe watching the Oscars or something like that. I do. I, I think so. But I remember I got bored very quickly and just wasn't that interested uh -huh. in it. Well, I think it's the sign of the times. And I think it plays very well into something you were talking about recently in a podcast about the incredible shrinking church. And uh, and I think you were spot on. Let's start with the numbers. And you actually link to those in your podcast page, which is linked up at crisismagazine.com. And uh, the, uh, the article is The Incredible Shrinking Catholic Church. And you actually reference the church statistics. And this is the point that I've often made when I've quoted these very same statistics over the years. If you were the CEO of a company that had these stats, how long would you keep your job? You would have been fired very quickly by the board because this is a recipe for disaster. And yet we're seeing 50 plus years of nothing but negative. The only positive number in the Kara stats is permanent deacons are always on the rise. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I feel like we, we often... Uh, put our heads in the stand, Catholics do, when it comes to the reality of what's going on. You particularly see this, I would say, in kind of the institutional church. What I mean by that is uh, diocesan offices, chanceries, uh, parish offices. And just so everybody knows, I worked for a diocese for five years in a chancery. I uh, volunteered very heavily at a parish for a number of years, still volunteer at my parish now, but that's a little different. And, and so 
we tend to just only, we gloss over all the bad news and we emphasize the good news. And I understand on some level why, why we do that, but we have to recognize the reality is that things are just dire in the Catholic church in America and they have been, and they're getting worse. It's not getting any better. It's actually getting worse. And the stats show that, and it's getting worse since I've been, you know, so for, I would say in the late nineties, nineties, people started thinking things were turning around that, okay, now we got, you know, JP two, we got uh, a lot of converts and we did have a lot of converts in the nineties, but actually they've just got, it, it, there's been a huge decline even in the last 20 years. It's not just since, uh, 1970, but even in the last 20 years. And so if we're going to reverse that trend or at least even slow it down, we have to be realistic that's happening and recognize, okay, we need to rethink what we're doing. Like you said, if I'm, if I'm the CEO of a company, all of a sudden my sales are tanking. I don't tell the director of marketing, Oh, things are going great. Keep doing what you're doing. I say, no, (laughs) change everything. I mean, or at least explore looking at changing everything because obviously what we're doing now isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. It's not working at all. I mean, uh, number of priests are down. Parishes are closing and shuttering their doors. Religious men and women are down. We realized very carefully uh, looking at these stats that not only are our children not being baptized, adults not either, but also people just aren't getting married anymore. I mean, it's not that they are not just coming to the church. They're just not getting married. They're just cohabitating. They're just living as though they're man and wife without getting married. Uh, So divorce stats are down. And uh, at, on the surface, you think, and that's a good thing, right? No, it's because nobody's getting married. So the church is failing to not only uh, maintain its numbers, it's failing really in a much grander scale to catechize the world and to save those souls. And how many souls are at stake here? And that's what's, I think, the, the real killer here. And one of the things you pointed out in your podcast that I latched onto was this really, you talked about sort of an effeminate culture that has come up within the church in the last 50 or 60 years. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so essentially what's happened, I mean, okay, first of all, I just want to make sure it's clear. There's a lot of reasons why the, the numbers are dropping. It's not one thing. I think sometimes we, we tend to point to one thing, say that's the reason. There's a lot of reasons. But I think when you kind of combine all the reasons together and look at it, what you see is, is that leading into the 1960s, the Catholic Church actually had a pretty good standing in America, i.e. the culture did not explicitly attack it. It even supported it in some ways. I mean, you had in Hollywood, for example, movies like The Song of Bernadette being made. You had the, um, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but like that Hollywood uh, organization mm-hmm. that made sure that, that movies were not immoral, weren't showing immoral things, right. things like that. And so the culture generally was letting Catholics uh, do their thing, grow without attacking it, uh, which is somewhat in contrast to, for example, in the um, 19th century when there's so much anti-Catholicism in the country. And so then, though, there was this dramatic shift in culture in the 1960s, which I think everybody knows happened. And I, I feel like the church was caught, church leaders, I should say, were caught flat-footed in, in responding to it. They continued to act like, oh, we're all friends here. Let's continue to act like, uh, pretend like the culture is with us. And so we're going to be more like the culture even. Instead of saying, "Uh uh-oh, seeing, maybe we're taking a prophetic outlook to see this, that, oh, wow, the culture really has shifted, and now it's going in a very uh, diabolical direction, a very directly anti-Catholic direction. Therefore, we need Mm -hmm. to start to recognize our duty is to stand against the culture. But you see so often that church leaders and just just continue to go along with the culture where it's the point where your, your typical Sunday going to your typical Sunday morning mass. Often the 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 externals remind you of everything around us. They're, they're not really standing out from the culture and what's being preached particularly is not standing out from the culture. And I feel like that's a major factor that the church did not recognize the, that the culture had changed and they needed to resist it now rather than just kind of go along with it. Do you think this is a case where we're going from kind of one extreme to another extreme or how would you characterize 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, the state of the church then was, were things fine and then we just overreacted or were things slipping and we over, we way overreacted? What was, what would be your assessment of that? 
I think it'd be closer to the latter. I, I, if you look at the numbers, you look at just different things, clearly some cracks were stirring the form, uh, particularly in the 1940s and 1950s. And uh, there's a great book, Steve Bullivant, uh, Mass Exodus, where he talks about this. One example he uses, I think is a very uh, good one, is that the move to the suburbs really did have an impact on the practice of the faith. Because before, mm. people lived in urban areas and they walked to their parish. And everybody in the parish lived in the neighborhood. So you're, you could grow up your whole life and you, you, most of your whole childhood, at least, and most of the people you were around uh, were also practicing Catholics. So y'all went to confession on Saturday evening. Y'all went to mass on Sunday morning. Y'all went to the same, you went to the, uh, the parish school, learned the faith from the priest. Everybody knew who he was. Then all of a sudden people started moving out to the suburbs. And now we have a disconnected reality. You don't have that physical connection, that geographic connection to your parish as much. It becomes more difficult. And you yeah. start to separate. Also, after there's a lot of, he mentions that in World War II, in all these men who were fighting in it, they had grown up only with Catholics. Now, all of a sudden, they're in the foxhole with Protestants, with atheists, with Jews, with everybody. And, and so they started to have a um, different view of these different religions and, and started to accept them more in, in, a, in a bad way, in, in a lot of ways. And so mm. you have this breaking up. And I think, actually, there's some arguments that Vatican II, part of the reason it was called was – because the, the church leaders did see, I mean, John the 23rd, of course, but in other church leaders saw these cracks forming and wanted to respond to it. The, the problem, of course, is, is that just based on the evidence, if the fire had started, they didn't pour water on it, they poured gasoline on it. Because you see then wow. an acceleration of the decline after Vatican II rather than a uh, slowing it down. So when we see, we especially look up in the Northeast, right? New England, New York, that area, we see all these uh, ethnic parishes, the German parish, the Italian parish, the, the French parish, this parish, that parish. Those parishes are gone. I mean, the buildings sometimes are in decay and being sold off and they're, co and they're consolidating parishes because there's a lack of priests, number one, but there's also a lack of parishioners. Those communities are gone. Did they just move? Did they all move west or did they move out of the church? Did they move into secularism? Uh, do you, is it a combination of everything? Yeah, it's all of the above. There definitely many just moved out of the area because you do see growth in, for example, Catholic uh, dioceses in the Southwest. Uh, and I, you know, I was actually the diocese I worked for was in Florida, and we were growing uh, size-wise because of so many people moving there. It was definitely migration, much, much of it from the Northeast. Uh, Arizona, similar situation in the Southwest. So that's part of it. But if you look at the overall numbers, you see that does not that does the fact is overall everything is declining the, the decline in these areas like the northeast are much greater than the increase you see in the southwest so people in the southwest shouldn't the catholics should not act like they're they're doing something better than the northeast it's just a, that's more just geographic and so what we see is definitely uh, many of them are leaving for a long time a lot of them were leaving to evangelical protestantism you saw that uh maybe in the 80s mm -hmm. 90s but what we're seeing is, particularly in the last 20 years, a greater increase of people just leaving religion altogether. If you look at the numbers uh, since the year 2000, all religions in America are declining. It's not just a Catholic issue. Uh, Catholicism, unfortunately, is kind of leading the trend, has some of the worst numbers, along with mainline Protestantism. But even uh, Judaism, Islam, even evangelicals are losing as well. Oh, wow. Hold that thought. Eric Sammons is our guest. His podcast can be found at crisismagazine.com. And I assume it's uh, everywhere else. You'd be pretty soon. Just look for Crisis Magazine on YouTube, for instance. Great place. I posted the link to it on all the live video feeds. You can find the link there, Eric Sammons. And the podcast is entitled The Incredible Shrinking Catholic Church. So the last 50 years have not looked great. They have been pretty negative downward trends. So after the break, I want to talk about what do we do about it? How do we go from here? How do we rebuild and accomplish the mission, the one mission Christ has given to us, the church? It's not just to love our neighbor, it's to love our neighbor so much that we make converts out of the neighbor. That's the goal. That's the ultimate charity that we must express. All of that, plus a lot more from Eric Sammons coming up right after the break. We'll be right back. Don't 
Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. Join us for the spirit world on the Station of the Cross. If we're really going to suffer, we really need to suffer here when we're in the church militant phase, right? The most difficult part for the poor soul is that they had some amount of that beatific vision in their judgment. They know they're going to get back to God, but then they're separated from God. So that's kind of the worst part because that's a spiritual suffering. The Spirit World, every Saturday at 11 a.m., right here on the Station of the Cross. Keep up to date with the shows we bring you each day on the Station of the Cross by viewing our programming grid on our website, thestationofthecross.com, and on our iCatholic Radio app. Just click the menu icon in the top left portion of our app and select the link to our programming grid. That's at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. atheists assert the only real form of knowledge is scientific knowledge, thus excluding any sort of religious knowledge, whether philosophical or theological. Such a belief is called scientism, and it's unreasonable for two reasons. First, it's self-refuting. Its truth cannot be verified by the scientific method. It's a metaphysical proposition, and as such, is not scientific knowledge. But if science can't verify the truth of scientism, well then, scientism itself cannot be a legitimate form of knowledge, in which case, it's self-refuting. Moreover, scientism undermines science as a rational form of inquiry, because it denies presupposed philosophical assumptions that are necessary to even do science, such as, there's an external world outside the minds of scientists. So, to reject God's existence on the grounds that it's not scientific knowledge is simply unreasonable. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Speed of Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. And coming up, when we say goodbye on the radio, we stay on the live video feeds for another half hour for the after show, where we interact directly with you. If you want to comment on anything we discussed today, you're welcome to do so. We talk about that, plus whatever else is on your mind and your heart. Just go one of the live video feeds. You can find everything on uh, our website, thestationacross.com. But I'm on YouTube. Look for Joe McLean there. Look for the Station Across. We're on Rumble and uh, Facebook as well. A Catholic take. Search us out. But uh, Eric Sammons is our guest. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Crisismagazine.com is the website. Highly recommend it. Really love it as a resource. Uh, but this uh, this conversation, I think, is very critical for the average Catholic to really pay attention to. The numbers aren't good. And I think for so long in the church, we've tried to ignore the negative, uh, emphasize the positive, and it feels like a bit like putting lipstick on a pig. And it really truly seems like we're avoiding the difficulty that we must face and deal with now before it gets worse. What say you, Eric Sammons? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Here's the thing. I get the idea of focusing on the positive, don't focus on the negative. But I feel like we have to acknowledge the negative. That's step one. Now, if we just wallow in the negative and that's all we talk about and that's all we think about, that's not a good solution either. That's not going to help anybody. But we have to, that's step one, because unless you acknowledge that there's so many people leaving and, the re, and, and look into why they're leaving, you're not going to get to step two, which is, okay, what can we do to bring them back, to bring more people in, to arrest this, the, this decline, all these things. Really, the... the um, the podcast I did was somewhat inspired in, in a bad way, I guess, by uh, somebody who I'm very close to who I, I discovered had, had left the church. And, and so and, and he was explaining, you know, his his issues. And then when COVID happened and the lockdowns happened and near the end of it, when the, the, his diocese said, OK, you can come back to mass now. He's just like, why? Why should I? I didn't like going before the lockdowns. I'm not going to go back. And, and and so I really was distressing to me. But. I had to realize, okay, what are the reasons this person left? Why did he, why did he leave? And how, how, what can I do to try to uh, convince him to come back? Obviously, it's the Holy Spirit who's going to bring him back. But what can I do? How can I be an instrument of the Holy Spirit? And that's really the reason we look at these negative numbers is to say, okay, now what do we do? Now that we see how bad mm-hmm. things are, how, how, how so many people are leaving, what do we do differently? 
Before you jump into that, I wanted to point out Michelle and one of our commenters on our live video feeds pointed out that uh, currently we do see a lot of immigration churches, uh, Vietnamese, Indian, um, and others. And that's true, but I, I wanted to uh, get you to comment on this before we jump on to the what we do about it part, in that I see a trend. When immigrants come to our country, they come as a block, they stay together, they're tightly knit. The Vietnamese community is fantastic. They stay very tightly knit, but their kids tend to go by way of the culture. And as they go by way of the culture, the, these these more recent immigration groups, I believe, are going to follow the older immigration groups. They're going to follow the Irish. They're going to follow the, the French and the Germans and the rest that came here, started the same way, but ended up becoming secularists. Do you see that as well? I think, though, it does tell us how important culture is for keeping people together, how important community is. Uh, for pe keeping people together. I mean, one of the things I mentioned in my podcast is I think that one of the reasons why there's been an acceleration in the decline of the Catholic Church and all religions in the last 20 years is the rise of the Internet and how you can get a kind of faux pseudo community on the Internet that replaces real communities. And I think that typically an immigrant uh, population, when a lot of them come over, they together, they, they want to stay together because they keep their culture. And I think that's a good thing. But like you said, what happens is, is that the wider American culture, which is, let's be blunt, anti-Catholic, anti-life, anti-family, yeah. it creeps in. And then you do see at second, third, definitely third and, and most definitely fourth generation. It's all obliterated. That community, that culture is is gone. And so they, they lose people as well. I mean, that's why you don't have the Italian and the German parishes, things like in the Polish parishes anymore not in strength because of the fact that they're now on many generations later. And I, and I sadly predict, I hope this isn't true, that the, the newer immigrant communities, the same thing's going to happen for them. So is winning the culture a part of the strategy by which we recover from the incredible downward slide that we've seen over the past 50 plus years? Can we win back culture, let alone evangelize the world? I think we can. I mean, I think obviously through God's grace, anything is possible, and I think we can. But I think the problem is, is that we often look at it, we ask questions like that, no offense, but in the sense of we look at the macro. And the fact is I, Eric Sammons, am not going to change the culture. I'm not going to mm -hmm. make it so the Grammys have a Christian artist up there rather than a satanic one. However, what I mm -hmm. can do is I can try to impact the culture around me. So the culture of my family, first and foremost, what is the culture of my family? I think this is where Catholics need to focus first and foremost. What's the culture of your family? Are you letting the garbage of the culture into your house? Are you, I mean, basically if you have a TV and you have the internet, do you have a spigot on there? Do you have something and just, are you opening it up and saying, come on in, or are you doing things to make sure uh, that that's not happening? Like, for example, did you watch the Grammys with your, with your kids, you know, some 10 year, 10 year old kid or something like that. If you did, you're letting the culture in and you're not helping the situation. So I think what we do is we do try to fight the culture by not letting it in first. And we create then countercultures. That's the big thing I, I wish our bishops and priests would understand is the Catholic church yeah. needs to represent itself as a counterculture because there are souls out there who know this culture is evil. They know this culture does not bring life. It does not bring happiness. It does not bring joy. And so what we need to do is say, we do have a culture in the Catholic church that brings life. It brings joy, it brings happiness. And so instead of trying to be, and you see so many evangelization efforts that they try to be like the culture as much as possible, but then they put a little Catholic twist on it. No, show yeah. that we're not like the culture at all. We're countercultural because then those souls who are in the culture, but they realize they, they down deep, they know how terrible it is. They're looking, they're, they're dying for something else. They don't know what it is necessarily. And if the Catholic Church says, oh, we're just like the culture that you hate, well, we put a little Catholicism on it, they're not going to be attracted to us. But if we say, listen, we're nothing like that culture. We are completely different, and we, are the, we have the way, the truth, and the life. Then those souls that recognize the evil around them will, will, will look to us and say, okay, maybe that is different. I'm going to look into, into Catholicism and see how it's different. So I really feel like we need to build this counterculture, and we do it individually. We do it as yeah. parishes. We do it as dioceses. We do it as the church. 
We're running out of time very fast here with Eric Sammons from Crisis Magazine. I, I kind of want to sneak in two questions. I'm not sure we're going to get away with it. But number one, is tradition going to save us? Can uh, the tradition of patrimony of Holy Mother Church be a part of that plan that brings back a revival in the culture? And number two, shouldn't the bishops in mass be leading the charge? Shouldn't their, their zealousness, the gravitas of their office be the weight behind which the lay folk get behind to re-evangelize the world? Uh, the answer to the first question is yes, that tradition it, it should lead the way because that's that's our secret sauce. That's what the Catholicism has that nobody else has is this this beautiful tradition. And so and that's what's countercultural because the world modernity rejects anything from yesterday. I mean, look at how we change our definitions of what gender and sex and and marriage are overnight. But we have that steady that, that steady rock of tradition. So yes, absolutely. Tradition is the way forward. It's somewhat uh, counterintuitive maybe that the way of the future is through tradition. And then also, yes, the bishops, like my kind of hesitancy there. Yes, the bishops should be the ones who are leading the charge because that's their duty as, as successors to the apostles. But the reality is the vast majority of them other than handful are not. And so we laity have to just step up and do what we can. Wow. Do what we can. But uh, I don't know, Eric, I argue that until the bishops do step up, we're going to see limited success. Do you think that's true? Yes or no? Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> that's probably true. I wish we had more time. Hey, I'm going to go into the after show, Eric. If you want to hang out, you're more than welcome to hang out. But uh, God bless you. God love you, Eric. We really appreciate your time and your insight into all of this. I encourage everyone to check out crisismagazine.com. The podcast is linked in the live video feeds, but crisismagazine.com. Look for the article, The Incredible Shrinking Catholic Church. There's a podcast there. You should listen to it. And he tells about his friend there. Eric, God bless you. God love you. And have a great day. God bless you. All right, coming up is the after show. Otherwise, we're going to see you right back here tomorrow morning for another Catholic Take. This is. Welcome to the after show. Praise be to God. We survived it. But only barely. I, uh, I am struggling. I got like the. Uh, I got the allergies, like bad. Like, man, I went for a bike ride Sunday evening, and it apparently all the pollen in a four-mile radius went straight up my nostrils because um, it dark, it tried to kill me last night. It really did. My wife was, like, uh, keeping me on the vitamin C kick. We do a lot of vitamin C. Do you guys do vitamin C? Let me know. Put it in the comments. Vitamin C, B3, swallowing garlic. By the way, you remember how they used to make fun of garlic in all like the vampire movies back in like the 80s? If you're my age, if you're of my vintage, you probably watched a lot of vampire films back in the 80s. And they would always like have the necklaces of garlic. Do you know why they would make fun of garlic? Because garlic is a natural remedy. Because garlic has a, or some really great medicinal quality to it. Garlic acts like a, um, an antibiotic. So when you were getting sick, people would eat garlic. You chop it up and you'd swallow garlic like a like you'd almost like you're taking pills because it would help your body heal. So it it has a lot of medicinal qualities to it. So they they associated that with uh, the in the anti-Catholic movement. They associate anything that uh, was come from Catholic culture. Uh, they would you know say is negative. So. Like the words hocus pocus, for instance, that is a that is a slight, that is a dig, that is an insult to the priest who's consecrating the host at the altar, saying in the Latin word, Latin words uh, of consecration at the altar. So they would say hocus pocus, the garlic, the the whole, you know, from that, the culture. It just needs total transformation, total transformation. Hey, let us know where you're commenting from today. I'd like to know. Uh, I'm going to go around here welcoming everybody. But if you're on here and if you're new here, uh, welcome. Praise be to God. Glad you're here. The after show is very loose. It's very casual. It's whatever you want to really talk about. Uh, you can just leave it in the comments. But I would certainly love to know where you are from. Uh, let us know. I would appreciate it. But uh, here on YouTube, anyway, I'm going to start there. Uh, Peter, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out today, Peter. Yvonne and Kim Sunderman. Good to see you, Kim Sunderman. By the way, Kim, I saw you at the Walmart the other day. You passed by. Uh, I'll recognize you as you're walking away. 
uh, was hanging out there with my wife and kids. And uh, good to see you again, Kim. Hopefully your family's well. Paul, good morning to you. Uh, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Paul, I'm going to be in Buffalo. I think it's going to be the, the 21st. I'm going to do an open house in the studio in Buffalo. Anybody wants to come hang out? I think it's the 21st. Let me just look at the calendar real quick uh, while I'm thinking about it. I want to make sure. Calendar, calendar, where are you at? No, it's going to be the 22nd. The 22nd of February, I'm going to do an open house in the Buffalo studio. And anybody who wants to come hang out can come hang out for the show. And we'll hang out a little bit after on February 22nd. So I'll, I'll share more information about that as we go. Colin, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out, Colin. How are you, my friend? Good to see you here. Praise be to God. Uh, Peter, where are you from? I'd like to know. Uh, do, 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 do. I thought I saw, yeah, there's my friend. Alan Smith, our friend from Canada. Good morning to you, Alan. Uh, how is the deep frost going, the tundra and the Arctic Circle up there? I mean, I know you're not quite to the Arctic Circle, but you're pretty close. You're a lot closer than I am anyway. Miserable Sinner is in the house. Praise be to God. Good morning to you, Miserable Sinner. Grateful to see you here. It says, pray the rosary, and Our Lady will help us keep the faith. Yay and amen. Well said, miserable sinner. By the way, I'm thinking about launching, because on Friday, Gabriel Castillo from Gabby After Hours is going to be our guest. We're going to be talking about the Holy Rosary this Friday with, Ga with Gabe. Uh, and I'm thinking about laying down a, a Lenten challenge. I want to see who will join me this Lent in praying at least three sets of mysteries every day uh, of the rosary. Uh, so if you're up for that, I want to think I'm going to create a little Lenten challenge. See who wants to join me in that every single day, at least three mysteries, you know, so what is that? 15, 15 mysteries at least every day, uh, during the whole season of Lent, including Sundays. You got it. I mean, you got to include Sundays. You can't just toss Sundays out and go, it's a feast day. No, you got to include the Sunday. Uh, so I wonder who's up for that. Let me know. Uh, Alan Smith, praise be to God, in the house. Uh, to, to, I'm, I'm scrolling past some great commentary there. Christopher Velasquez, good morning. How are you, my friend? Good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. Really do appreciate it. I see Sharon in the house. Praise be to God. Bring in Father Chad Riverger. Oh, Sharon, if, if put in a good word for me. I have asked Father Chad to be on a, one of my shows for going back a few years now. I've asked probably three or four times, and every time he says no, every time. Now, I wouldn't hold it against him. I would love for him to be on. Uh, I would absolutely enjoy having a conversation with Father Chad Ripperger, but if for whatever reason, he doesn't want to come on my show. And I'm sure he's got good reasons. I'm not trying to diss him in any way. I would love to talk to him. I've enjoyed listening to some of his lectures, and I thought it would be great to have that conversation with him, but... So far, it's not happening. Um, but there are some other exorcists I could get on for sure. Um, I've talked to a, a few over the years. So maybe I'll get somebody else on. Uh, to, to, he said he would educate kids on the demonic. Of course. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. I think he does a great job. And I would love to talk to him someday. Katie, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today, Katie. Good to see you. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Katie, for the congratulations. I really, really, really do. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see here. Over on Facebook, I see... Oh, I gotta, I gotta move this. I gotta move this over here where I can actually see. I'm blind and old, and I can't see any darn thing. Sean! Sean, good morning to you. Um, it was stated, the following Catholics online cannot replace a Catholic in person. What I'm seeing is Catholics online are actually practicing the the practicing than the Catholics we meet in person. Well, you know, they're hypocrites in, uh, in every walk of life, in every corner of the church and beyond. There's no question. But I've met some pretty incredible Catholics, Sean. I've got to be honest. I've met some pretty fantastic saints in the making uh, in my life, you know. So the reality is, we all have concupiscent natures and we're all just, we have these disordered passions that we rarely put any effort into combating and fighting back, right? And to, like, here's a question. And when I give talks, I, I, I've traveled, I've been blessed to travel around the country and overseas, giving talks to parishes, conferences, retreats, things like that. And I often, I give a, I give a series of, uh, I do a parish mission called The Radical Choice. 
and it's a series of talks. It's usually over a few days. And so um, one of the points I make in that radical choice, and by the way, if you guys want to listen to those talks, I'll be happy to post links. Um, one of the questions I ask people is, have you made the commitment to become a saint? It's an, it's interesting when you when you're standing as a speaker and you're looking out on a crowd and you ask these questions, the look back is priceless. Because the reality is most people, most people have never made the choice to become a saint. I mean, they have never even really thought about it, right? Like that's not, it's really crossed their mind. But you think about some of the great saints, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux wanted to be St. Therese. Like that was her goal, to become St. Therese. St. Max Colbe and St. Padre Pio and some, you know, some of these incredible saints, Teresa of Avila and Catherine Siena. I mean, you just go on and on on St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Dominic. These are people who live their life as though this was their only goal. It was sainthood or bust. There was no second option. And, uh, and yet the vast majority of Catholics today have never even truly contemplated the question, let alone made the decision. So just like today's saint of the day, which was, I always pick, by the way, do you notice this? My seat, this is okay. Don't tell anybody. I'm about, what I'm about to share with you, you can't, don't do it. Don't tweet this. Don't, don't hit the smear. Don't do it. All right. But when I look for saints of the day, I intentionally look for saints you probably have never even heard of. Okay. I always look for the, the quiet saints that you've never even heard of. So you learn something new today. Um, and I always, honestly, I look for martyrs, okay? Because dying in your bed of natural causes is not as inspiring as had their head chopped off for the faith. It's just, mea, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. If they're still saints, praise be to God, they're still saints. But nonetheless, it's not as inspiring. It doesn't, it doesn't ignite the heart quite like a martyr does. So St. Theodore uh, Stratellus, Stratellus, Stratellatus, Stratellatus, I'll get there someday. St. Theodore Stratellatus, a Roman general who, when asked to recant, absolutely denies it. And they're like, ah, oh, he'll be fine. Let him go. He'll be okay. He's a good general. He's a good soldier. He'll be all right. They let him go. What does he do? He burns down a pagan temple. <laughs> like, this guy sold out for the faith. This guy had a, a determination to become a saint. So they arrest him again, and then they torture him, and they try to get him to recant. And what do they? What does he do? He starts singing the Psalms. I mean, this guy is absolutely resigned to becoming a saint, to entering into the beatific vision. So this is what we're talking about here. Like, have we? Are we prepared for that? Like, if you get arrested tomorrow, and they give you the ultimatum: torture and death, or recant your faith. How many? of us would just simply recant our faith because we can't fathom the idea of enduring a torture. I mean, I'm not saying like, oh yes, I can't wait to have my skin ripped from my body. Like, no, that's ridiculous. Nobody wants this. Like, this is not a thing that people want. But the question is, how sold out are you, right? Like how sold out are you to, are you prepared? Are you, would you rather have your skin ripped off or deny the Lord, because our Lord says in Matthew 10, if you deny me, I shall deny you before the Father. So people who are resigned to be saints, even though they don't want to be tortured, are still willing to be tortured because the alternative is not even questionable. It's not even thought, it's unheard, it's not possible. Like it's absolutely insane to consider rec uh, recanting and, and uh, denying the faith, denying the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ um, would not even be an option. And I think that's the issue is so many Catholics today, they are simply content with this world. I mean, I'm talking about good Catholics that we go to church every Sunday. They, they drive the 15 passenger van. They got a bunch of kids, you know, like, like we do. Right. I mean, you know what I would love to see tangent side, side tangent here you, on Sunday coming home from church. We got passed by a bunch of motorcyclists, uh, speed, speed bikes doing race, drag racing. Like there ought to be a drag race of 15 passenger family vans coming out of the church. Like that would be super cool. That'd be kind of funny actually. Nonetheless, I digress. How many families do you know that they wouldn't think this way? They wouldn't articulate it this way. But if they're being honest, they would probably, you know, come to the conclusion that they just kind of want this world to work out. To be honest, they just, listen, we want our kids to grow up. 
We want them to be healthy, happy, content. We want them to go to a great college. I mean, I mean, they got to go to our alma mater, right? I mean, they got to carry on the tradition. They got to join our fraternities, our sororities. They got to they got to get the tattoo, and they got to do the uh, the secret, uh, you know, keg stands that uh, we used to do as we were kids. And then, of course, they got to get great jobs. I mean, they got to make a lot of money. Okay, you know, my my son works very hard, very very hard, and I knew because he has a strong work ethic, my oldest son, who's married with three kids, I knew that when he uh, was going to get a job and while he was in high school, which I was not keen on, um, he got, he went to work for fast food. Well, he, he, he shows up to every shift and he works a full shift and he works hard. So they're like, you actually show up for work and, and you have a pulse. Oh my heavens. Here's the key to the building. You're the manager. Here's the deed. You're in charge. So uh, so then, you know, we were like 2 o'clock in the morning. Where's our son? Oh, he's closing the restaurant down. Good grief. You know, so um, when you have a strong work ethic, you stand out in a crowd because the reality is the majority of your friends, the majority of your generation doesn't have a strong work ethic. They tend to be very lazy, very complacent. And the same the same trends we find in Catholic church circles, even strong Catholic church circles, you know, uh, we want our kids to, as I said, go to nice schools, get great jobs, make a lot of money, uh, have nice living, they have good friends, fancy, fancy homes, cars, you know, and all the rest. These aren't bad things in and of themselves, but attached to material materialism is a weight. It's an anchor on our soul. So we have to use these things for what their purposes are, but not be so attached to them as though we couldn't live without them. And the reality is we are designed to be wayward uh, on this earth and on a journey towards heaven, towards the promised land, into the beatific vision. And we can't be attached to this world. And yet, uh, how many parents really are, are, uh, are not asking the question, am I... Am I committed to becoming an ax, an absolute saint? Am I all in? Like Cortez, Hernan Cortez, 1519, scuttled his ships as he was starting to make his expedition inland in Mexico. Now, and you might have been told that he burned those ships. He did not burn his ships. He scuttled his ships. You know why he scuttled his ships? Mostly because he needed the sailors. He couldn't spare them. He needed as many men as possible because he was outnumbered 300 to 1. And he needed the men in order to have his best chances in his expedition inland. But he scuttled those ships. It also was a psychological thing for the men. They had to choose. There was only one way, attack, go forward, never backward. And they had to make that choice. And it was at all cost or else. And uh, uh, my, my producer, James, is commenting in the back end here. Let me see what he says. Uh, do, 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 do. Let me scroll this down here. James says, Adam Bly, uh, a uh, Paredes, a religious. Go ahead, James. You can you can go ahead and uh, jump I on the mic. The proper and pronunciation of that is Paratus. Paratus. Go ahead and why don't you just go ahead and share it with us? Yeah. So uh, just referencing your little uh, discussion about Father Ripperger there. I had a thought of Adam Bly, the co-host of the Spirit World here on the Station of the Cross. He and Debbie Giorgiani do a uh, live show on Saturday yeah. mornings here. And um, he is actually a church-decreed expert on religious demonology and exorcism, so that is actually what the term paratus means. So I had that thought of maybe that's someone you and your listeners might be interested in hearing from yeah, on the show sometime course. for those topics. Absolutely. I've interviewed Adam Bly on a few occasions. I've met him on one occasion. He is fantastic. I always, I mean, I, I would say Adam Bly is is even maybe greater than Father Chad Ripperger in some ways. For me personally, what I mean is helping me to open my eyes to really truly understanding the world of the diabolic and the the rules that apply there. Because if you don't understand the rules on the back end, all you're left with is Hollywood. And if Hollywood is your is your catechesis for the diabolic, you're in great trouble. So uh, what, you're probably scared of the night. You're probably scared of the dark and sounds in the dark, and you're scared of everything. You think you're going to be possessed, you know, uh, at the uh, on a whim. And the reality is that's not how it works. It doesn't work that way. And it's people like Adam Bly, Father Chad Ripperger, and others 
who have really helped to educate me personally and so many thousands of others onto how this works. And I would say it's confidence building. It's, it's enlightening. And you realize you don't need to be scared. There's, there's nothing to be scared of here. Uh, live in a state of grace. You have nothing to fear. God's holy will be done. So I would say, yeah, let's get Adam Bly on. That would be amazing. It'd be good to get him back. Absolutely. And then and you I just want to say, mention he actually uh, released a book in September, late September of 2022, uh, called The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession, where he actually reiterates a lot of the same points that you just made. So that's definitely worth checking out if anyone's interested in that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And then what, what were you saying about my son and, and, uh, and uh, fast food? Oh, I spent three years at Burger King doing the whole, uh, I was I was in the same spot, looked at as like the reliable guy, the guy who showed up every day. Right. I got asked to be a manager, make it a career, all that stuff. And I did the yeah. 2 a.m. closing shift all the time, closing oh, the store. Yeah. So I felt like you were talking about myself. It was kind of crazy to hear. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? It's like, what? You're, you've are you come back to work today? Like, man, <laughs> yes, exactly. you are the boss. <laughs> You know, but my 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 son's current job, uh, he works for a Catholic gentleman who runs a, a shop called Texas Truck and Tire. They buy and sell rims and tires, and they ship them in. They ship them nationally. And my son runs his shipping department, and it's a lot of work. And I was asking him last night, uh, you know, how things were going, and he's like, they're having a hard time keeping people there because it's hard work. And they're paying a decent starting salary. It's not minimum wage, you know, and, but they need guys to want to work hard. And the reality is they, they, they're having a hard time finding men who will work hard, <laughs> you know, and that's the reality of our culture today is we've, we've become very complacent, you know, um, and which is why we do need absolute immigration reform because you can't get food in the grocery store if it wasn't for immigrants who are willing to work hard to, to help you get uh, food in the grocery store because most Americans won't work that hard. So it is a major, major issue that we're dealing with here. And it's, uh, it's a very complex problem to be sure. Uh, Sci-fi, Mike, and uh, I see Brick Wall, our friend Brick Wall, we're weighing in on the garlic issue over on Rumble. I says, well, Popeye was a coasty uh, Popeye the Coasty, Coast Guard guy. He ate garlic, then he joined the Navy. No more garlic. <laughs> Did Popeye really start as a Coasty? I think I knew that, actually. I think I might have known that. Like his first, like th the early days, right? Then uh, then he went Navy after that. Smart guy. Uh, Gunslinger says, and for allergies, a spoonful of local honey. I can't do honey, Gunslinger. I had to give it up because I'm carnivore now. Honey is nothing but carbs. Trust me, I would... I'd down a whole bottle of honey if I could, but uh, I, I can't. I can't do it anymore. Um, let's see here. Two, two, two. Lampert. I've had Father Lampert on, Sharon. Father Lampert's great. I've had him on a few times. It's been a while. I can get him back. Leticia, good morning to you. Uh, good to see you here. Thanks for hanging out with us. I really would love to talk to uh, Father Chad someday, though. But I don't know. Every, I've asked a few times, and I guess I probably overstayed my welcome at this point. So I don't know that I can keep bugging him. Uh, but maybe I should just take a tip from the gospel and just be persistent. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Colin says, Father Chad is amazing. I agree. He surely is. Um, um, Yvonne says, I've been listening to the, the new podcast with Father Martin. I think that's his name. Yeah, Father Martin. Uh, Father Carlos Martin is the one you're referring to, Yvonne. It's really awesome. I have to pray, I have to pray before him because I get spooked easily. Yeah, you know, we, Yvonne, you know, when I before I started the Catholic Take, I was at Catholic Drive Time, and he was one of the last guests I interviewed there. I've known Father Carlos Martin for years, actually. He was a parochial vicar here in our neck of the woods uh, many years ago, and um, I so I got to know him a little bit. He's great, he's fantastic. And he tells great stories too. So when he's when when I heard that he was going to be doing this podcast, uh, and there were going to be there was going to be a high end production element to it, I I was happy to get him on. And I wondered, I wondered because Hollywood wants to spookify this thing up because it's drama and drama sells, and that's what they're going for, right? The, but one of the things Father Martin said when I asked him during the interview about that, he said, "Well, yeah, they're." They're definitely trying to play up that element. 
And uh, but he says I had full control over catechesis and making sure that I, this I, is something I can live with and not just be some Hollywood thing. So I was very impressed by the fact that he retained that control, even though they uh, they were going to go for the drama on that. You know, and side tangent, uh, many years ago, I'm talking 2004, maybe 2005 ish, when I was uh, probably my heaviest ever, 400 plus pounds. I auditioned for The Biggest Loser Season 3. Wait, I don't know what year that was, Season 3 of Biggest Loser. And I got a call. I got, I got called back. I got two private interviews with the producers. And they were in the process. It got so close to being on that show that I, um, uh, one, they, took, they brought me in for a private interview at a super high-end fancy hotel in Boston. And I'm sitting there on the couch in this hotel room and they're filming this interview and, you know, we're talking and they are playing up the drama element and they're trying to encourage me because now, so you don't know, 2002, I had a mystical experience with Jesus Christ that changed my life forever. Okay. But it put me on a wild ride of discovery and I was, I was headed Protestant again. I was going to drag my wife, who barely was hanging on to me as it was because of my issues of pornography addiction and all the rest, that she wanted to divorce me at the time. The mystical experience saved our marriage, saved our lives, changed everything. But I was going to drag her out of the Catholic Church. And by the end of 2003, I was prepared because of all the research I had done in apologetics and in early reading the early church documents, specifically those from the uh, late first and all of the second century uh, documents I could find, uh, second and third century, I would say even, um, I was prepared to give my heart to Christ and to his Catholic church, which I did that in late 03. So by 04, 05, I'm still a baby in this whole thing. Like I, but I, was, I knew at that point that I couldn't be a closet Catholic. I couldn't just be a guy who says he believes something, but then you would not know it like publicly. Like you wouldn't, if I went to work and you didn't know that I was a Catholic, if it wasn't, if I wasn't living my life to the point where you, you could smell it on me, I knew there'd be a problem with that. You know, I ain't going to be no undercover Catholic at that point. I knew I had to be committed. So I was, uh, I was forcing myself to try to find the courage to live my life publicly. So I would put like miraculous medals on my ties. I'd pray before my business meals with, with vendors and bosses. And, and it, it was, it was a nerve wracking experience to be honest with you. But when, uh, when I applied for, uh, to be a contestant on the biggest loser season three, I was thinking, oh man, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna get a chance to lose a bunch of weight. They're gonna pay for it. It's gonna be fantastic. So I, I apply. I sent them a demo tape. They liked it. They called me back. They were meeting with me, and uh, but they were playing up that drama thing. Oof, man, did they want me to be dramatic? They were like wanting me to cuss. They were wanting me to like stir the pot, and I was not at all comfortable. But I have to admit, I have to confess something. I got to confess something. I felt the pressure as I was sitting on that, that, that audition couch, so to speak, at that hotel room in Boston so many years ago. I felt the need to try to be dramatic. So like I, I had used incredibly foul language growing up as a teenager and as a U.S. Marine. I, I used the F-bomb like it's breathing air. It was my adjective of choice. And, uh, and anyway, I had committed myself, uh, because once you get to know Christ, you can't live like a pagan anymore as Christ, as uh, St. Paul would exhort us to, we have to put away the old way and take upon the flesh of Christ. We have to die in baptism, be resurrected with him from the water. So I, I, I gave in on that couch and I, I cursed and the instant it left my mouth, I was like, dang, I just sold out. I'm a sellout. I went to confession over that. But um, after that, I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do now? They're going to put me on this show. It's going to be terrible. This is not going to be good. So uh, I remember because they got to the point where they were like, Joe, all right, listen, we're going to fly you to California and we're going to do a weekend with you. And we're just going to make sure you're not going to die of a heart attack. Okay. And then we'll probably put you on the show. 
So I had to go to my bosses. I had to ask, request to have the family leave act thing so I could take off the time. They were going to hold my job for me up to three months potentially. I had to go get a, I had to go to the doctor and get a medical exam. And then, then I was telling my priest about this and my priest begged me, please, please do not go on this show. <laughs> he said, don't do it. They're going to, they're going to use and abuse you. And it's going to be an embarrassment for you and for your family. And don't do this. Don't do this. And I was like conflicted because I'm thinking this is my chance to lose weight. I mean, to get paid to do nothing but lose weight and still pay the bills. So, um, and at that time, you know, we, we had, we were in the process where we were adopting our oldest son and my wife came home from, from her job and she was making more than me. So I was working three jobs to make ends meet. And I thought this is an opportunity. So I really wanted to go, but I was very conflicted by the grace of God. I got a phone call from the producers and the directors. And they were like, listen, oh, you are a strong candidate, but we've made a decision and we're cutting you. We're going to go in a different way this season. We're going to totally change the season from last. So you didn't make the cut. And, uh, and we just gave God praise. <laughs> I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do it. But uh, so anyway, so Hollywood plays up the drama bad, but I would, I, to circle it all back and tie the bow, going back to Father Carlos Martins, I'm very proud of him that he made sure that they can play the drama, but he was going to ensure that the uh, catechesis was there. So hats off to him for making sure that he can leverage the opportunity to reach as many people as possible in order to actually share the truth about the spirit world, the devil and diabolic, because too many people dabble in that all the time. Uh, let's see here. Yvonne says, I still struggle with the language problems. Been literally biting my tongue sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a reality, isn't it? You've got to change the way you think, the way you, the way you leverage language. You know, it's part of the reason why I give God praise as much as I do. I try to praise God uh, frequently throughout my day. And I, I try to build that into my language, my habits. Uh, because I'm, it's penance for me for making up for how many times I have used my tongue to do evil things. And uh, so you have to change the way you think. You have to change your habits. And it has to be intentional. You got to make the choice. You got to say this far and no further. It's just like the same choice we make, you know, to say, hey, listen, I, I no longer, I no longer, uh, you know, want to live a secular life. I no longer want to live the life of the world, the flesh, and the devil. I want to be a saint. Make me a saint. And so I would encourage you, especially this Lent, I would challenge you. Maybe every day during Lent, get on your knees and ask God to make you a saint. I mean, I'm talking canonized saint, right? Like none of this, none of this. Yeah, I want to live a quiet, holy life, you know, end up in heaven. No, 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 no. Go big or go home, right? If you shoot for the stars, maybe you hit a street lamp. You shoot for the street lamp, you ain't hitting nothing, right? So go big. Ask God to make you a saint uh, this Lent. Um, and trust God for, for the grace to accomplish it. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's right, Colin. Uh, Alberto, our friend from the UK, says, I swore as a teen, but not at home. Yeah, I swore too much. All of my friends, family, everyone swore. It was, it was um, it's pretty bad. Good morning, Leticia. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, got to run, Sharon. God bless you. Thanks for hanging out with us. I appreciate it. Father Lampert, I should try to get him back. But Adam Bly would be a great guest, actually. Love to get Adam Bly on. It'd be wonderful. Uh, Sci-Fi Mike says, Popeye a garlic? Was he a Roman? Was his real name Papyrus? <laughs> I, and I grew up watching uh, Popeye cartoons. <laughs> And what did you guys think of Robin Williams' interpretation of Popeye? Were you a sci-fi brick wall? Were you guys fans, not fans? Robin Williams, I mean, one of the greatest comedic physical actors in the history of the world. Too bad that his demise was so tragic. Depression, drugs, the rest. Uh, really a tragic loss for the world. Um, pray for the repose of, the soul, of his soul. Pray also for those that suffer from depression. Fame and fortune, the world of flesh and the devil. We should not be attached to these things. Uh, these are bad things for us and for the world. Let's pray for complete conversion for those that are struggling. Like Sam, 
the transgendered binary, whatever the heck he wants to call himself, who's uh, playing into the hand of the devil. God help him. He knows not what he does. All right. That music means it's time to say goodbye today. God bless you. Thanks for hanging out today. I really appreciate the uh, the after show stuff. God bless you. We're going to do more in the future. We're just still kind of getting set up, kind of getting going here. But do me a favor, subscribe to our channels. Make sure you're in the loop and share us. Help spread the word about A Catholic Take. I'd be super grateful to you. A Catholic Take, share it today. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you tomorrow.